Hello and welcome everyone, Denzel Rodriguez here, your personal finance geek of the 21st century. I have my friend Chris Kirkpatrick with Life 180 and we are here live at the AND Asset Mastermind Day 2. And we're going to be talking about why now is the most important time to buy whole life insurance. I listened to a gentleman named Tom Wall. Yeah. All right? I've Amazing. never heard of this guy. He talks yesterday. Yep. Blew my mind with spreadsheets yep. and comparisons. One of the key takeaways that I took out of it was he basically said that whole life insurance is a better bond. Yep. Now I, I don't even know what a bond is. I'm not I'm not that educated. I, sure. I didn't I, I always understood bonds suck, like uh, just uh, or or they're not that great or um, they play a bond, role. Like, they play a role. Sure. Like I, this this is just like what I've heard about them and what my clients, how they feel about them. They're just like, oh, you know, it's safe, pretty secure for the yep. most part. You're gonna get a, a, a certain rate and you can buy a certain type of bonds. There's treasury bonds, there's, mm -hmm. there's a 10-year, five-year, corporate, year, bonds, there's five corporate, year, bonds, corporate there's bonds. Yeah, there's all sorts of bonds. And it, it seems like a, a very, very big amount of money that, that, that people feel safe. Uh, yeah. to, to put their funds yeah. in. So when Tom sure. made that comparison of when looking at someone's portfolio, usually it's it's made up of stocks, mm -hmm. bonds, mm -hmm. mutual funds, indexes. And so all he was doing was taking the portion that you all here watching that you're putting a, a portion of your money in bonds. And mm -hmm. he's just saying, and he was tracking over a 30-year period how whole mm -hmm. life beats out a, a bond and Historic. and historically, historically. yeah and he, sure. and he used different time points mm -hmm. going all the way back to the the early 20s i think early 20s or 30s he went totally. that far back so uh, i'm i'm curious your your background your understanding yeah. of bonds and, and just based on what he said and why you agree with this and, and some additional things that my audience can really like For really sure. take away from and understand you I love know? It. yeah no so um I think it's it's an interesting idea. Um, one of the things that he touched on that I think is is really really important uh, to understand um, because I've made a bunch of videos on this recently in the past year, um, and it's funny because I've I've got some one of my one of my most popular videos right now that's going on is a short video that's like I think forty seconds long, and it's all about why you should use whole life insurance instead of bonds. And it's interesting because it's it's getting a lot of activity, but it's getting a lot of hate, right? And it's getting all these people are being like, oh, my bonds are getting this and this and this. The statistics I was using were from a year and a half ago, because that's when I made the video, right? And so the bond rates were lower, performance in whole life insurance was lower, like all of it, all of it is what it is, right? Yeah. So, and and I think uh, one of the things that, that Tom talked about in the video or on, on his presentation was the fact that during the first 10 years, uh, a bond portfolio is going to be a whole life insurance port account 100% of the time. Right. Okay. So, exactly what Tom said. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's important to understand, but it's one of, and we've talked a lot, and one of my favorite phrases is you can't solve long term problems with short term thinking. Right. And so it's, it's just really important to understand like what is the intended use of the money that you have going into. The bond portfolio or any kind of safe money portfolio whatever whatever that is and and if that is in fact uh the goal of that money is for safe money emergency fund opportunity fund long-term stability uh for our investment accounts right i i think then looking from a long-term perspective would you be willing to be a little bit behind um like the growth curve, so to speak, uh, from a financial net worth perspective in the first 10 years, if you knew virtually with 100% certainty that from year 10 and beyond, you're going to outperform it, not by a little, but by a significant amount. Yeah. Right. Like I think most people, especially for you, cause you're a younger guy, right? Like and your audience is more probably youthful, mm -hmm. right? Than mine. I mean, mine is young enough, but I think at the end of the day, um, the younger you are, the more important this is. And okay. it goes back to, uh, at least for me, it goes back to like a fundamental philosophy. For me, I'm a big believer that people should save before they invest, but they should save with the intent of investing. Okay. Right. And, and so 
that if you believe in that, and then you go, okay, where, 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 where's the best place to save? Where's the most effective and efficient place to save my money? And, and if you think about it from that perspective, then it's like, all right, I'm saving money. I'm not investing money. I'm saving money. What does that mean? It means you can't take risk. So what do people do for that? It's savings accounts, CDs, bonds, or whole life insurance. Those are really the only places that you could do it. And when you start looking at it, it's interesting right now, and I'm just going to call out the elephant in the room because a whole life insurance policy right now, we, we have to think, once again, this is all about thinking long term, okay? Because if you look at a whole life insurance right now, and you even compare it to a high yield savings account, or a bond, or a CD right now. CDs, you can get five and a half, six percent right. on, on a one year CD. Yeah. It's a high yield savings account, four, four and a half percent right now, you know? So a lot of people look at the the dividend rates in a whole life policy and be like five and a quarter, but the net net of it all, you're going to be negative the first couple of years. Yeah. And the 10 year outlook based on current assumptions for dividends, you're looking at like three to 4%. So people are like, well, why would I do that? Right. I'm, and it's, yeah, it's a logical uh, question. Yeah. You should be asking yourself totally. that and really walking through that with, you know, a, a hopefully a really educated uh, agent like yourself or yeah. um well no not not you're not uh licensed. i am licensed oh yeah oh yes i got right. it again four oh, months yeah, ago yeah, 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 so. yeah so you are yeah okay, cool so i'm correct on that it's okay but um someone that can i guess just show the options like thoroughly through like the way tom was running through it and i'm just yeah. shouting him out again because just the way yeah, it was he, good stuff way he ran through these these different case studies mm -hmm. blew my mind I, there was things i'm not even talking to my clients about that are hidden benefits by using a whole life you're now saving tremendously on the tax on the tax expense side. and when you look at the fees of bonds yep. versus the fees of the whole life there's something to be said there well it's well. not a net net comparison right so if somebody could say chris why would i do a whole life policy when it's earning three percent well if you look at a 10-year time horizon for a whole life policy and we say that the internal rate of return is three percent at, at the end of the day and then we look at a bond portfolio and they go, oh, I'll get 5%. That doesn't take into account the fees and the taxes in that. Whereas with a whole life policy, it's net net after all fees, expenses, charges, yeah, everything. And that doesn't even count for the fact that you get other benefits in the whole life policy that you're not going to get in a savings account or a bond or a CD or any of these other things, right? And so we have to, if we're going to compare uh, one asset to another, one product to another, we have to compare all things equally. And we have to take all the variables into consideration. And unfortunately, um, that's just not the way people, most people do it, right? Right. Now, help me with this. Yeah. If I got, a say, a 10-year bond, mm -hmm. and w once it's done, the, the money's paid out all at mm -hmm. once, and then I would have to, say, yeah, it's gonna be, it's right gonna be worth the next bond. Yeah, you could roll it over into the next bond at that point in time. There's a lot of different ways to buy bonds. Either the bond market is actually very complicated. Okay. Uh, we'd probably be on... Yeah, call yeah. for two hours or uh, you know but when it comes to the distribution of a bond mm -hmm. how does that work once it's completed it's a lump sum to it's, my account it's done yeah it, it typically that's how it that's how it will work okay. so you buy a bond that bond matures you get a payout right so mm -hmm. just hypothetically speaking um if we did a, a 7.2 percent interest rate right the rule of 72 we take we divide it by uh 10 we got or what, it, what would it be? We, like 7.2, if it were, a, whatever it is, I'm, my yeah. math is all jacked up. But let's say that money doubled, you put a, a $10,000 into a bond and you know, 10 years later you got 20,000. It, it, based on the rate of return that the bond is getting, it's 20,000, you're gonna get that, uh, it's, you're gonna get the 20,000. It's, it's very illiquid in the process, right? right? Uh, but then you have it and you have to figure out what do you, what do you do with that money then? That's another that's another negative that Tom didn't really cover a whole lot of, but that illiquidity of that money carries a lot of opportunity cost. Correct. Right? Because if you lock your money up, nobody knows what the next 10 years is going to look like. Nobody knows how much opportunity is going to present itself. Um, it may wind up being good, right? I mean, you may keep the money in there and it may be the best option for you, but chances are it's... It's not going to be. There's going to be opportunities that present themselves, better economic environments, um, you know, for different opportunities to get uh, better returns that are still safe. Um, and if that's the case, like, do you want your money tied up? And you know, when but and that's another advantage of having a whole life policy uh, compared to a, a, 
uh, a traditional bond is because if you if you do that, uh, then you have the liquidity of that money the whole time, right? Right. So what? So when I'm talking to a client that say has a bond, mm-hmm. and they're they're going to keep rolling over. Uh, how how long can you get a bond? Is it ten years the max? Oh or is it no, thirty. 30 when uh, when I when I was born, my grandfather bought me. A, so I was born in 1980 at the peak okay. of inflation, right? Like mm. it was 13 and a half percent inflation, 1979, right? I was born in 1980. Paul Volcker just jacked the federal funds rate up to 19.4 percent. My grandfather bought me a 22 percent bond. 30 year, he put $500 into it when I was born. I don't remember how much it was worth, but it was worth a lot at the end. And it basically helped me cover a lot of expenses and stuff for college. And, and like, I mean, it was, it was a 20 year bond. Sorry. 20 year bond. 20 year bond. Um, but 22% for 20 year bond, but you can get up to 30 year bonds. You get up and, to 30 year. And, okay. and, and, and like not to go down this rabbit hole, but when we talk about kind of circle, I guess it's not a rabbit hole. We're circling back to the original question is, why now is such a good time to buy whole life insurance? Yeah. Back in 1980, if you understand life insurance companies, the way that they manage their general funds, what they do is they're, they're always managing long-term risk and they're managing purchasing power. That's why I always tell people like life insurance companies are going to do one thing and one thing better than any other financial institution on the face of the earth. And that is to manage and preserve the purchasing power of your money. Period. That's what they do. That's that's their fundamental job with their general fund is to get the best rate of return possible with the least amount of risk. That's why these companies have always paid a dividend. Yeah. Right. That's why they've never missed a dividend payment. That's why they always have returns even in down years. That's why they're always positive. And the bad COVID year, 2008, dot-com bubble, Great Depression, they always make money. Always. 100% of the time. It's, it's, they've never had losing years. And so when you look at it like that and you understand that, and, and then in 1980, we had extremely high bond rates. Well, it was high inflation too, but what have we had from 1980 up until 2009, effectively, we had declining interest rates, right? But the thing is life insurance companies had a lot of 30 year bonds on the books, right? And so what happens if from 1980 to 2010, they, they were in 1980, let's say they bought, um, you know, 22% bonds or 20% bonds that were 30 years, right? 1981, maybe they bought 21% bonds that were 30 years. 1982, maybe it was 19, 1983, it went down and it kept laddering down, right? But it kept elongating. So think about it in 2015, this is where regulation 7702 came in because what happened is nobody ever saw an environment where we were going to be in this zero percent federal funds rate environment for 10 years. Nobody right. ever saw it. So what happened was that low interest rate environment for so long, it got it to the point where all of the old bonds that were supporting the general fund and allowing them to keep the guarantees and the dividends and everything really high, that got so stretched out and all those matured and they're like, whoa, we got to roll this 15% bond into a 2% bond. What are we going to do? They were toast. Yeah. And that's where the 7702 changes came in because the stress and the pressure that put on the general funds was immense. I mean, that's not all of it, but it's a huge a, part a nice of chunk it, of, right? Of the general fund, a nice chunk is dedicated to corporate bonds. Oh, 100%. Okay. Bonds, corporate bonds, treasuries, uh, real Got estate. It. Yeah. Back so, security. Yeah. So, now we're, so we're in 2023 now yeah. and basically the, the biggest mutual life insurance companies that our clients are using to yep. say practice either infinite banking or just high cash value life insurance policies, that kind of a thing. Yep. Those insurance companies still have to buy these bonds, correct? They're, they or, all do. Yeah. I mean, it's like they're just yeah. getting a much lower rate. hundred percent. And that's where, uh, over the past, you know, 10 years, every life insurance company, it, they are mandated to have a certain percentage and I don't know the exact percentage, but it's high percentage. Let's just say 60 to 70% of their general fund has to be in safe bonds. It doesn't have to be treasuries or corporate or like all the same balance. So, but they have to be AAA rated bonds. Like, got it. Right. And, and those are the safest of the safe of the safe assets. Now, the reason why right now is, um, such an fascinating time, like for a nerd like me, uh, you know, about buying whole life insurance is because, 
if you it, if you look at a, a an illustration on a whole life policy, let's face it, like whole life insurance has a little bit of a bad rap because it's, it's wildly misunderstood, right? Right. And if you don't understand, and I think a lot of the reasons it's misunderstood because there's a lot of bad agents that are doing things that they don't understand, yeah. and they're they're selling it in ways. Um, they're selling it off the illustration, let's face it, right? And so so think about it. If, if I were an agent and I sold you a policy in 1990 and that illustration was assuming, let's say the dividend rate in 1980, it was pretty close, it might have been a little lower than this, but just to keep round numbers, was 10%, right? So what, what, what I would have shown you was an illustration and you look at the guaranteed section, then you look at the current section and that current section is gonna show, here's what this, per- this policy is going to perform as at the current dividend scale, yeah. right? That's 10%. So now from 1990 to 2010, 2020, whatever All beyond, the, the dividends buyer, have right. been lowering and lowering and lowering and getting cut in half effectively. Yeah. And so that policy that you look at the original illustration that you had with that policy and you're looking at the performance in 2020, you're like, holy cow, this thing did not even come close, right? right? Mm-hmm. And so now what happens is because assuming I was not the, the agent that I am and I, like I didn't educate and I just sold you like this this spreadsheet I was like Denzel this is just see what you're gonna get see what this does right and I didn't educate you to really understand how it works well then you're gonna be disappointed and honestly you, you probably would be hurt right because yeah. if you're expecting that right. and then you have half of that for instance mm-hmm. that could have really dire consequences on your personal financial goals Right. Whereas today, whereas today we're coming out of the lowest interest rate environment, long term interest rate environment we've ever seen. Right. And we finally have interest rates going up. And so we are at the lowest dividend scale that these companies that pay dividends ever every single at. year have ever been at. OK. Right. And we're looking at a situation where now interest rates are going up. And so I, you and I as licensed people are not allowed to look at a client and be like, hey, look at this, it's gonna outperform it. Like that's just not compliant, it's not whatever. Right. But I can say with very high levels of confidence because I know how these things work inside and out that there is a high likelihood with any company, by the way, <laughs> that whatever you look at, look at on a spreadsheet right now on the illustration, whatever you look at, it's probably going to be it's probably gonna outperform whatever the illustration looks like 10 years from now. Because, I mean, let's face it, a year and a half ago, interest rates were, what, 2%? Bonds were 2.5%, you know? If that, now they're five and a half, six percent 6%. And so what, what, this is the first time, literally in over a decade, 15 years, that the insurance company has been able to replace um, lower level bonds okay, right. with gotcha. new higher level bonds. Because here's the deal, when, they're, once again, these guys are the smartest people in the world at managing risk, right? So like in the 80s when they said, ooh, this is a unicorn event, we can lock in 30-year rates at you know, 20%, yeah, let's do that. Mm-hmm. But uh, inversely, when 2009 happened and the federal funds rate hit zero and bonds went through the floor and it was horrible, they're not locking that in for 30 years. They're lo- they're doing like three-year bonds and they're, uh, they're trying to churn that okay. money as fast as possible. So now that rates are going up, it's going to be a really cool experience to watch these companies start to like kind of help their general funds, general accounts recover. And we're going to see dividend rates go up. They're going to tail because make no mistake about it. And Tom said this in his call uh, on his, on his, on his talk, these companies all compete with each other. Right. Because they know most agents are not going to sit here and do what we do and try to educate people. And really, most agents are just going to sell off the illustration and sell be like, this is what you get. Whoever's promoting the best right. illustrator rate. That's and so the whatever the best dividend is, is going to illustrate the best for the most part. I mean, there's some variance there, but like for the most part, like they got to compete with each other as far as that. And they all publicly, except for one company, publicly declare what their dividend rate is. And, you know, with that... If, if one company, I'm not going to name companies, but if one company does it, everybody else follows mm. because they have to. It's a competitive environment. Gotcha. So on a micro level now, mm-hmm. if you're talking to a client that had a 10, 20, 30 year bond that was um, 
at a relatively low rate. So, so start. So, when did the rates start to collapse? When did you say that the bond rates started to? Just the bond rates down? really started to go down in like two thousand six, two thousand seven. Right. Okay. Yeah. So let's say someone got a bond during that period. And I'll and preface it's expiring. it. It was going. They've been going down consistently since, since nineteen eighty. Okay. But it was 2006, six seven where they started really getting just like really historical tanked. lows, historical lows. And still, people will buy them, right? Yep. So uh, yeah, but nobody's buying a thirty year bond at that level. That's okay. the thing is like long term bonds kind of like stop. They still exist. It's okay. still possible, but yeah. like nobody's buying them. Okay. Like nobody wants to lock their money up. They're gotcha. You're buying, but in that situation, there's like a negative return because you're buying bonds that pay out at less than inflation. So you're like literally losing. Purchasing. Right. So is there a correlation to bond rates going up and then whole life insurance? 100%. Coming? Okay, so there's a Bonds, problem. like, and uh, I have this. I don't have it because we're I'm not at home in my studio in my office. But I can show you uh, historical dividend rates and uh, bond rates trailing each other, right? I think he yeah. showed something. Yeah. I think Tom so showed something actually, like that. Oh, I, there's a white part. I'm so tempted, but no, like <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the uh, um, yeah, you can see there. So there's always a crossover point. So when when the um, I'll do it here. I'll try to do it like this. So when bond uh, when uh, interest rates, the federal funds rate and bond rates uh, were going down, what happens is the you have um, you have the whole life uh, the whole life dividend rates also go down, but what happens, there's a crossover point in there, right? Because dividend rates are always gonna trail bond rates, right? Mm -hmm. And so as bond rates are going up, dividend rates are gonna chase bond rates up. Okay. But then when they go down, bond rates go down, what's gonna happen is the dividend rates are gonna then chase them down, but there's always on the way down, there's a crossover point where the dividend rates are gonna go higher than the bond rate, and is that right? what we're experiencing? And then it's gonna, right? And then it's gonna follow it down. No, it's actually the opposite. It's the opposite. But, okay. but, but, um, that's what we had in 1980, where the bond rates, uh, there was a crossover point, and the dividend rates have been higher than the bond rates because the bond rates were dropping, and it was what it was. And there's always a trail because the dividend rates were from like, there's always like a two-year trail typically, okay. right? But once again, we have to think long term. Right, and so it doesn't matter what the bond rates are right now. It doesn't matter that interest rates are growing up. I mean, it matters, but like not from a thirty-year perspective, right? Because right. in the next thirty years, they're going to go up and down and up and down, and like that's just going to be the cycles of it. We have and we have to know that. And so, what you're doing when you put your money in a whole life policy is you're basically giving the life insurance company permission to manage your safe money bond portfolio for you, giving you other benefits with it, and allowing you to keep liquidity. Keep of that money. Right. Now, are there going to be times that the bonds are outperforming your whole life policy? Absolutely. Like right now, right. right? Which the next maybe five, six years, that will be the case. And, okay. and from our perspective, we actually want that. Or because um, we're saying that we're yeah. seeing, okay, as bond rates go up, just like yeah. you said, dividend rates are going to follow. Yeah, So exactly. A client locks in, a, a, say, a relatively low dividend rate now, which is in the five, six yep. percent range with most mutual yep. uh, insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And then that, that guaranteed rate mm -hmm. is another, I would say, key factor, right, in, in all of this? Yeah, I mean, the guaranteed rate is there. Um, you have the guarantees inside of the policy, which are, which are fantastic. Um, but like as bonds go up right now, let's just say for the next five years, uh, we're in this interest rate environment and bonds keep going up. Uh, slowly, predictably, consistently, uh, what's going to happen is that the insurance companies are going to buy those bonds. Mm -hmm. That's going to improve the performance of the general fund of the insurance company. When you and I and everybody watching owns a whole life insurance policy with a participating mutually held company, yeah. it is exactly that. You are participating in the profits of said company. So the better they do with their general fund, the better the dividends are paid out to you as a part, like a, effectively a shareholder of said company, right? And so as their performance, the general fund goes up, the dividends go up as well. Now, let's say six years from now, rates start to come back down, right? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen is while you were performing, the whole life policy will perform a little worse than bonds on the way up. But when they go down, 
you're going to have better returns on the way down than the bonds. Mm. And you're going to have that, those, it's just going to go up and down. It's going to be a happy little dance. So to, to recap here, I buy a whole life. Mm -hmm. I'm participating in the, in the growth of the economy overall. Totally. Tax free. Yep. Or tax deferred is the yep. properly way yep. to say it, right? Yep. Tax deferred. I'm also going to get to a point in my whole life insurance contract where the expenses are reduced. Oh, huge. Yeah. Right? Whereas a bond, you're consistently mm -hmm. paying a certain percentage cost, mm -hmm. right? Each and every year yeah. of management mm -hmm. types of fee on the whole balance. Mm -hmm. Whereas with a whole life contract, it gets more efficient as time goes on. Get more the right. most inefficient time of a whole life policy is going to be the first five years. You know, inefficient. In, in, in most okay. inefficient okay. time of Got a whole it. life policy is the first five years. If 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 everybody in the world had the ability to get a whole life policy and start in year seven, it'd be the most popular asset on the face of the earth. Okay. And it wouldn't even be close. Like <laughs> it, it it literally wouldn't even be close. It, there'd be no competition. Um, but because people don't think long term enough and they look at, oh, I'm going to put in $10,000 for my premium and I'm only going to have liquidity of 5000 or 6000 like they look at that as a, as a negative, you know right. what I mean? Whereas if we can teach the audience, your audience, my audience mm -hmm. here, if, if anyone yeah. has a bond, yeah. you already were locking this money up. Yeah, it's a liquid. It's a, it's a liquid. If you're putting money into a 401k, it's a liquid. Right, like these kinds of things that people are willingly giving up control and liquidity of their money anyway. Yet when it comes to this, for some reason, there's that disconnect. So yeah. being able to say, "Hey, the same money you're willing to lock up and get a safe rate of return in whole life, we can get similar." Hundred percent. Yep. And then over a long period of time, we can historically prove that you'll be better off. Yeah. And, and you'll have more. Yep. And another thing, Tom. Walt pointed out was the distribution phase of those funds. Oh yeah, where it's he's amazing. saying if you're if you're if the stock market's down, mm -hmm. you now have a, another vehicle that you can pull cash from, and and the account itself be unaffected. Yeah, I mean, there's there's um, that's a whole different that's animal. A whole different right? animal. That's, a whole yeah. different, that's probably a different <laughs> video, that's right? Different like video. we're getting into distribution <laughs> planning, right? Like and like utilizing whole life insurance as a volatility buffer. So we won't go there, we won't We're, go there, sorry. But like, no, it's amazing, <laughs> like I love it. And we'll, we should do another video before we leave on that, maybe tonight or something. But um, it's, yeah, the, the one thing I wanna say, because I, you know, I was, when I made the comment, and I thought of something as you were, as you were talking, um, when we talk about the fact that if anybody could start this at year seven, it'd be the most popular thing in the world, but it's the short term. Um, I think it's fair that a lot of people and I alluded to this a little bit, but I think it's fair that whole life insurance has a bad reputation because of the bad representation of the product over the past 40 years. Yes, of the the agents deserved yep. it yep. Uh, for what? Because of the, the economic environment we uh, lived in, com with which is the lower, uh, the reducing interest rate environment, which yeah. led to the reducing dividend scale environment, which led to the policies performing worse. And then you have that, that that combination of that with agents not really educating their clients and just kind of selling off illustrations and uh, yeah, uneducated consumers getting involved in something they don't understand. And and it's not that it was bad for you. Um, it was that if it, anything can turn bad for you if your expectations are not in alignment with reality or if you're not really putting your money into a product that you understand, right? Like, And so that can always go bad no matter how safe the asset, right? And so, I think that's where people like Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman and stuff like they lived like think about it he built his whole reputation and brand and hatred for whole life in that environment yeah and he saw a lot of people get hurt mm -hmm. and I get it and he like you know what I mean yeah it all makes we're sense. going into a complete inverse situation where you and I could sell somebody these policies and there's super high likelihood no matter what we show them it's going to do better. That's pretty awesome. That's, it is very awesome. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like what a what a what a great way to maybe um, restore a bad reputation. Totally, you know, especially yeah. if us agents and yep. those that are learning, those that are agents learning from Chris, or even some that are learning from me and uh, wanting to get into the space, being able to just provide that transparency and listen to people like Tom Wall and yourself go 
go very, very deep in the, in the historical track record when just simply comparing not someone's investment dollars, mm. but someone's savings dollars yep. in bonds, CDs, money market accounts, savings accounts, checking accounts, m- money that they think is in a safe location. Yep. We now get to have the conversation of, hey, if all you did was redirect it here, you're getting this tax-free death benefit, mm-hmm. which is something that is not talked about as much. Even I don't talk about it, so sure. that's, that's something on my <laughs> part I can totally work on. Living benefit. You got the living benefit of the cash value, so you have some liquidity up mm-hmm. front in the beginning of money that you already were planning on mm-hmm. making illiquid, right? Mm-hmm. So you have increased liquidity. Yep. You now have your money in a tax-deferred slash can be used properly tax-free environment. And then you can even be more strategic in how you distribute uh, your your tax-free income in the retirement years Mm -hmm. when certain markets are not doing too hot. At at least you don't have to sell because you have all this gain over here. Right. Ride out that storm when that starts to shoot up again. Then you maybe turn this off. Let this can keep growing at that mm-hmm. tax-free compounded, and start pulling from here. So, a very unique way of pulling from all your uh, quote-unquote retirement accounts mm-hmm. to have that stream of income and just increase efficiency. Plus, oh. plus, if you if you do this at the right time and you do it with the right company, not all companies do this the same way. Um, but during retirement. I don't know how much everybody knows or how much you talk about this on your channel, but we're 70% more likely to need long-term care than we are to just die, right? Yes. So when we look at that, there's a high likelihood that in our retirement years, we're going to need access to capital to help us with our medical stuff, right? So being able to, if you become critically, chronically, or terminally ill, if you get the policies with the right companies, that also solves that problem for you in retirement. Yeah. Which is huge. That is huge. And that, if you have that handle, it gives you permission to spend and do and live the rest of your life mm-hmm. in a more fulfilled way. And that right there, we can close it right there here. <laughs> it's been an honor to have you again and hang out in person and yeah, learn. Man. I got to tell my audience specifically that I've been learning so much more that I'm going to have more value to bring to you guys uh, to help you make even better financial decisions with your whole life policies, those who have those in place, those who don't, you know, I sort of been very linear thinking, short term thinking. Chris helped me think more long term with the way I design my own policies and, and the way I will uh, acquire more policies in the future. So there's so much to be said about just looking at track records of different products and, and how they line up. So it's like technically I'm involved in the bond market, but like, through mm-hmm. a, through an organization that knows the best way. You're allowing the best of the best to manage your bond portfolio effectively. I mean, you know. That's... In the most safest, arguably safest location, yeah. tax-free location. Uh-huh. And there's just, there's, once, once I'm able to get that point across with the client, there's no argument. Now it's just a matter of how much, yeah. how long. That kind of a conversation. Yeah, totally. so, Absolutely. To reach out to, to Chris, go to Life 180. I'm going to have all the description, all the, the links to, to check him out. And I, myself, Denzel Rodriguez, check me out as well. Yep. Uh, we both do levels of coaching and, and trainings and webinars. Yep. And, and we're hanging out. And it's just a, it, it's a privilege. My position, 27 years old, it is a privilege to do what I do. Um, and so if you have the desire to to create content like Chris or like myself, you can also reach out to us about that. Yeah, totally. Because that is going to help with the activity income that we generate, being able to step into the social media space, monetize, create value just through your words. Love it. Right? Yeah. So with that, God bless everyone. Have a wonderful day. See you guys. We'll be talking soon.